All right, everybody, I'm back with another Real Singers on Singing with my series that's called Opera Singers Do It Better. And I'm with uh, the return of Craig Sirianni and his beautiful wife, Dalen. And they, uh, we are going to talk about technique. We are going to talk about old school versus new school. We are going to talk about uh, the state of opera, how COVID affected it, uh, where things are going to go. And uh, that's it. So I'm going to turn it over to Craig. Craig, what's happening? Thank you for doing this again. Hey, listen, I, I'm the one that has to be thanking you, Dan. First of all, the, the last podcast we did was, what, two years ago? Yep. Give or take? Yeah. I still get calls from that all the time. So your podcast has got some juice, man. They, they're going out there. People are hearing them. That's I'm cool. still getting calls from the first one, which is why I called you about, you know, hopefully uh, convincing you to do a second one with a slightly different topic this yeah. time, um, which I think is really important. Um, but, but, but yeah, big thank you to you, by the way. Uh, thank you very much. And then, um, you know what, before we start, uh, I didn't even ask, let, let just, I know we did probably did it on the first podcast and then I messed up a podcast, everybody. My audio went nuts and I had read <laughs> all over it. I must've been singing in a hallway. I don't know. <laughs> it was awful. And so, and then, and then I couldn't render it because it was very, very long and I drank the whole podcast and we drank, we had a blast. It was like three hours long. It was so much fun. And, uh, and I, and I just, it, I couldn't get it rendered. And, uh, I said, let's just do redo this one. So it's my fault. But also tell everybody about uh, your career, how uh, where your career, how you, how you had a career in, in opera, and now you're now you're teaching, and uh, and go from there, and then we'll. See. Wow, that's well, that's a that's a big one. That's a lot. That's a uh, that's a lot of information. Um, but uh, to put it in a nutshell, uh, I was a typical university, typical university tenor trying to be trained um, because I wanted to be an opera singer. And I can remember leaving the university, coming home, and uh, spoke to my parents who were still alive at the time, and said, "Listen, you know what? I I'm not really sure what to do at this point. Uh, my teacher doesn't really know who to send me to. I don't know anybody in New York. I don't really know what the next step is. But at that point, you know, I, I already knew that my voice was, you know, nowhere near um, advanced enough to have, actually have a real career, and Strangely enough, while we were sitting there talking about this on the couch, um, the uh, that one big famous Richard Tucker gala happened to be on that night. We're all sitting around, we're watching TV, um, and Jerry Hadley happened to make his debut on the Metropolitan Opera stage because he won the Richard Tucker gala that year. And he came out and sang and he was singing along. He was doing the Pearl Fishers duet, which, you know, a lot of the uh, tenors who joined the studio at that time will remember because we all kind of saw Jerry Hadley at that time. And a lot of the guys that joined the studio at that time saw that on TV and we all lost our mind. And, you know, not only, but it, it was two things. First of all, the voice was absolutely gorgeous. I mean, Hadley always had an incredibly beautiful voice. Uh, which is, you know, why he became a, such a big recording artist. Um, so I'm watching this guy sing, and not only am I blown away, I'm about to fall off the couch, but I'm seeing a technique, a, a technical application that I've never seen before, really, or noticed before. He's singing all these great high B flats, and every time he opens up his jaw, you know, he's singing like this. And, you know, I've never seen that before, but, I, you know, I can remember being mesmerized watching this guy and it was my mom who piped up and said, listen, you need to find out who's training these guys. There's a guy for you right there. You're, you're falling off the couch. You're watching this guy. He's in New York. You need to find out who's training them. I said, I, so I said to my mom, I said, oh, that'd be a great idea. What am, I, what am I supposed to call him on the phone? And she's like, yeah, why? Why not? What's he going to do? What's the worst thing that could happen? So somehow, and I never found this out before, I mean, my, my parents were both killed in a, in a car accident. Uh, so I never really found out what happened or, or as far as her being able to find his number, but she found it. And the next day she handed it to me and she said, here, I found the number, you make the call. <laughs> so I did. And I woke him up of all things, you know, the poor guy, I hear I was worrying about, uh, you know, aggravating him. And I actually woke him up out of a sound sleep. The guy couldn't have been sweeter he couldn't have been 
more attentive. He was so helpful in the phone call. He was so taken by the fact that I called him to tell him how wonderful I thought his performance was on that on that Tucker Galley. He was like, oh, well, you know, thank you so much. I mean, I mean, that really means a lot to me. He was the most sincere guy ever. And here I was afraid to call him. <laughs> so in a nutshell, he said, look, it, I will not only give you Tom LaMonaco's number because the article in Opera News that quickly followed that Tucker Gala was all about Hadley talking about his his teacher, uh, Dr. Thomas LaMonaco. And I was like, I don't know who this guy is, but I'm going to find out. Anyway, you know, Jerry said, listen, uh, not only will I give you his number, but I will call Tom and let him know, give you the introduction, let him know that you're coming into town. When are you coming into town? And I said, well, you know, about a month or so. And um, when I showed up, Tom was expecting me and he said, ah, you're the young, you, you're the young tenor that uh, Jerry Hadley told me about. Come on in. And, you know, the rest is history. I sang the worst audition humanly possible for Tom <laughs> for two reasons. You know, I was rel completely underdeveloped and I was scared to death. Um, Tom was the kind of teacher who took me aside. He said, after I finished singing a ridiculously underpowered version of... Literally that much voice. And Tom, the first thing he did was he went. <laughs> he leaned forward. And I was like, oh, God, I better go home now. For This was a horrible idea. And Tom sat me down and said, listen, I want to talk to you for a minute. Come on over here. Sit on the couch. He said, listen, you're probably one of the most musical people that's ever come to sing for me. And, and I'm like, my eyes started lighting up. He said, you know, you're very musical. Your Italian's you know, great. Your musicality is great. Your interpretation is wonderful. And I'm, my head's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then he says in the same sentence, and your voice is horribly underdeveloped. And I went, <laughs> right? Yeah, I didn't know which way to go emotionally. <laughs> I said, uh, what do you mean underdeveloped? I, I have a degree in voice, Tom. He said, yeah, bring your degree over here and come to the piano. That was my first lesson. So Tom, almost at 70 at this point, um, he said, listen, don't do, don't do anything. Don't, don't ask me any questions. Just look at what I'm doing. He said, copy me exactly. Okay, make this sound. And Tom, <clears throat> Tom hit a whatever on the piano, G, whatever, I don't know what it was. He says, just do this. He says, I don't care how long you hold the note, but do this. And he went. Oh! Then he said, make that sound for me. I said, nope. He's like, what do you mean, no? And, you know, of course, I had all these images of, you know, blood spraying out of my throat and my cords flying out because I didn't have any concept like most university singers do. All I had were albums at the time. Um, all the, the albums that my father was sending me to college when he found out. Now, keep in mind, I was a heavy metal singer at the time. OK, and that's what I thought. That's the direction I thought I was going to go into when my parent. Now, my father knew all about opera. So when he found out that I was now going to pursue a career in opera, I mean, he just he started sending me. I, I never heard. He sent me my first Delmonico album, my first Corelli. I'd never heard these guys before. I mean, I heard, you know, I had a Pavarotti albums when I was in school and I started playing this stuff. And, you know, e even though. You know, and I still have a great love for, you know, hard rock, heavy metal. I mean, every interview I did for every opera company, whether it was the newspaper or the news or whatever, right. they would always ask me the same question is, listen, how does a heavy metal guy who comes from a heavy metal background, how do you show up singing opera? Yeah. And, you know, it was always the same answer. I was like, listen, think about it. It's really not that different. The vocal technique, of course, is completely different. And, it's, and the vocal approach is, of course, completely different. But, you know, opera is drama. You know, it's 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 it's, it's costumes. It's makeup. Thank you. I was, having, <laughs> no, I, I, I was blanking out. I read your mind. And you know what? Heavy metal to me was the same thing. It was costumes. You know, I was putting makeup on back in the 80s. I was wearing big, you know, spiked yeah. armbands and stuff, you know, all the crazy stuff. And to me, to be able to do that and still put on costumes, still be dramatic. And yet, once I heard that sound, Dan, there was no going back. When I heard Corelli, the first, <laughs> when I first played the first Corelli album that my father sent me, I, the first thing I did was go. 
Yeah. And then the second thing was, oh man, maybe I should be, you know, maybe I should become an herb farmer or something. Cause <laughs> if that's the sound I'm expected to make, I don't know. But my university teacher did something wonderful that nobody else did. He gave me a great love and appreciation by playing me several examples and really opening up my mind to what opera singing was all about. That gave me the hunger that it took to drive me forward. From there, it was finding Tom LaMonaco. Now, once, once I found Tom and really started to discover what you know, technique was all about, I mean, the rest is history. See, we play albums. The first thing that you hear when you hear Delmonico, you hear Corelli, you hear Giacomini, you hear these old school singers, you hear Squillo, okay? That's what you hear, chest voice, Squillo. But it gets misinterpreted immediately because every uh, anemic university professor out there does the same thing. They play an album, they hear the singer, and they say, okay, hey, Dan, okay, let's work on your Squillo today. Okay, this is backwards. Okay, it's been backwards for a long time. It was bad when I was working with Tom back in the late 80s. Now, it's really, really, really bad. So this, um, is, what, this is what you want to talk about. This is basically what we're getting. What the, yeah. the whole thing is going to be about is about how you, you feel the, a lot of the art, the art of the technique is getting further and further and further and further away from what it was intention and intentionally supposed to be or i guess or you know what it was supposed to be and then as years go by just like i guess watered down is what, what yeah. kind of a way to look at it right yeah. so what do you feel like this is one of the questions i wanted to, to kind of ask and it kind of fits in with your whole where you're about to go so what do you feel the difference in the technique of old school versus new school and you were just about you were just saying squealo uh, but we all hear the word squealo and all the teachers would say the word right but um, do you feel it's it's chest voice? Do you feel it's head voice? Do you feel it's uh, the nasal pharynx making the buzz? Do you feel it's the the back of the throat making the buzz? What is the tech? What is the technique, Lamonico, which w comes from Stanley, and then Lamonico and his brother kind of refined it, right? So, what do yeah. you feel that technique is? Well, here's the thing: you hear the first thing that always hits your ear is squealo, and it's the easiest thing to misinterpret. Like I said, a lot of the a lot of the university teachers now they'll hear that sound and say okay now we're going to work on your squealo because that's what you know that's what all these great you know singers had you don't work on squealo squealo is not something that you go after and try to create and that's exactly the loop that we've all gotten caught caught well, we've all got caught into now is is this idea of trying to make squealo and that's why everybody is squeezing pinching placing you know uh high light bright ah, right right squealo is not something that you create squealo is a byproduct that shows up when you open up the voice and start using it correctly that's what all the teachers forgot about today so all the university teachers they play an album they hear it and they think okay let's start going for that let's go for that focus sound okay and what and inevitably they do is they tie you up in knots. I mean, every tenor that calls me, Dan, and I've got, you know, depending on the month, between 35 and 40 guys, depending on how the month is going, and it's always the same thing. You know, Mr. Suriani, any chance you can help me at all? Every time I sing past an F or an F sharp, it hurts my throat. You know, my throat's killing me. Some of these guys end up in the hospital. Uh, I mean, I've got all kinds of horror stories from, you know, university students, but the idea is that it creates a, it's creating now today a, a, a nonstop loop. A singer, a young singer will go to university thinking they're going to get trained correctly. They don't, okay? They get trained by an anemic uh, book smart professor who never stepped foot on the opera stage. So he really doesn't have any, he or she doesn't really have any concept of, of the amount or, or quality or sound, uh, quality of sound that's expected for two or 3,000 people. So they really don't have any idea. Um, people are paying people to show them something that that particular teacher has never done. That doesn't make any sense to me. That, that's complete nonsense. And yet we're paying more and more all the time. These, these kids are paying $60,000, 
a semester or a year or whatever the hell it is to go to, you know, NYU, Manhattan School, whatever. I'm not calling out any specific college. It's just in general, the calls I get then North America, South America, Europe, all over Europe, Australia, uh, you name it, Costa Rica, they're all telling me the same thing. Daughter, I thought it was turning. We don't have any, they're all telling me the same thing. We don't have any teachers anymore. And my throat hurts. Can you help me? And I'm starting to think, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm starting to get really worried that there isn't anybody teaching this really big, really old school technique. You know, a couple of horror stories from the university mentality. Um, you know, I've, I've got several of them, most of them in grad school. And I warned them right away. I said, listen, I'm happy to work with you, but be aware that there's going to be an inevitable clash at some point. And one of the guys that, you know, I work with, sure enough, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the guys I work with at a very prestigious, you know, school here in the United States, which I won't name, nor will I name any teachers or name anybody by name, because I think that's horribly unprofessional. I'll never do that. Um, but he got better very, very fast, very quickly while he was working with me. Um, and it became very embarrassing to his teacher because the other students recognized it, the other teachers recognized it, and they all knew that it couldn't be coming from his own teacher because they were aware of his work at that point. And now they're aware of his sound now. So his teacher's embarrassed. So what does he tell? The first thing he tells the students, look, you know, we don't, uh, great, it's great that Suriani is helping you really. But the thing is the old school singers worked too hard. They sang too dark. They worked too hard. They sang too loud. We don't need to do that anymore. It's a new day. It's a new age. Let's not work so hard anymore. With microphones. <laughs> okay, that's the first thing he was told. Then as he continued to work with me, and his voice got better and better, the teacher got so embarrassed, he said, he basically told the kid straight out, look, he's in his last year of grad school. He said, look, if you continue to study with Suriani, I'm afraid I may not be able to allow you to graduate. He threatened the student with his own graduation. Now, I don't know where it is in the college handbook where it says that you can't do with your own money, on your own time, outside of college, what you want to do, but that's what they were telling him, and he took it to the dean, and the dean told him the same thing. That's what we're up against today out there, Dan. It doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter if we're in the States, or in Europe, Asia, it doesn't make any difference. They're all being told the same thing. So how do you feel about, um, is, a, is a little thorn in my side, like, how do you feel about all the, the, lately, the last, I would say the last eight years, nine years, maybe 10 years, like the last 10 years, I've noticed an uptick on YouTube and, uh, you know, different, uh, uh, what you gonna call, I can't speak right now, different platforms. Um, the science of singing, like everyone talks about the science and they can spell it out to you with the muscles and well, the R times six squared, two, three, two, if you do this to the cricket thyroid and do this to the thing, then you can sing this and that. However, the, the teachers can't sing very well, but they're talking all this math and science, which is great. If you want to learn that, I think it's great. You can learn all about, you know, all the muscles and all the nerves, and everything that operates. That's great. But if, if the method that your teacher or whoever is telling you, is, and shouldn't it work on the teacher as well if they're teaching it to you? Should well, I mean, the teacher will be able to go, well, then I can, I'll, here, I will show you. But that doesn't seem to be what's going on out there. It seems to be there's a lot of science talk, and it seems to be they're using that as almost like smoke and mirrors. Like, let me impress you with my words. Exactly. So I'll hide behind these words over here. You know, it, how do you, how does that make you feel knowing that I know you and I know your how you you know we've talked about Lamonico many times and how you learn and it was like sweat in the studio. Get ready, go. Not. Okay, so we've got a little gentle muscle over here, and he's in the larynx, and we're going to make it <laughs> right, right? We're going to make this one contract because that was something I went through for, I don't know, twenty years probably. I was sure. a professional singer. I had a career as a you know whatever corporate band singer, wedding band singer, whatever you want to call it. But I was searching for teachers, searching. I took from everyone, but that's all I ever got. It's all I ever got until I ran into. I started to just 
I ran into one opera singer and I just stuck with him and my voice started to grow. And then I learned more from this. Then I went to Spain. I studied with an opera singer there. I went to see my daughter and I knew that this famous teacher was there. I'm like, I'm going to that guy. And I just, then I found you and I just, I'm going to take a couple lessons from this guy. Like I want to see how, and, and it all, a lot of that, all, all these good ones all tied in together. Whereas all the teachers of the ones that didn't really sing great, they, nothing lined up with anything. It was just like, it was written, they could read it to you, but it didn't really line up in what they were, what was te- were being taught. Yeah. I mean, Stan, yeah, Stanley's works. book, Stanley's Dr. Douglas Stanley's book is still out there. It's called, you know, I believe it's called, I got it's, it. called, it. I, I, it's, I, it's I, called your, it's called your voice. I think you have it right. I mean, read that. It's fascinating reading. Everyone's read this. It's yep. fascinating reading. Yeah. Guess what? Read as many books as you want to. Right. And then step out on stage and try and sing. Right. Now, again, it's fascinating for the people who, who want to, to, you know, intellectualize the study of how the voice right. works. But you know what? That's, that's great. That's great. As long as you keep it, you know, internalized. Right. But as far, if you want, here's the definition of an opera singer. Then let's make it easy. An opera singer is a guy who walks out on stage without a fucking microphone. Sorry. Without a mic. Okay, he walks out on stage. There's 2,000, 3,000 people, whatever. Okay, with 90 pieces of orchestra and sings on the stage and everybody hears him over the orchestra and sings opera. Basta così. That's, that's the definition of an opera singer. I don't want to hear about anything else. I don't want to hear about who recorded what, who made a, who made a fucking album with the Muppets, who's walking... <laughs> who's walk- Who's walking out with a microphone? Now, they, all my students, they, 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 you know, listen, I understand this because I did the same thing when I was young. My students are all really, really enthusiastic. They send me videos every day. Hey, hey, have you heard this guy? Have you heard this guy? Have you heard this girl? Whatever. Right. And I'm watching these videos and I'm watching every one of them walk out with a little microphone on. Yeah. And I still can't. And you still can't hear them. Right. So that's what that's what we've. Sorry if I'm shouting, but you know, you, you, you rile me up, Dan. So what can I tell you? You're so enthusiastic. I'm, I'm a passionate guy, but you know what? <laughs> oh. that's, what that's what we're working with. And, and people go to the opera and, and they're telling me, and you know what? They had a mic on and I still couldn't hear them. Right. Now that's not opera. Okay. That, okay. And we can also talk about, you know, maybe uh, besides the fact that nobody can teach the technique anymore, or maybe, well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say nobody. Right. There's probably just a handful of people out there that still remember how I this agree. goes. Okay. There's a handful of people out there that still remember. But the majority of them really are, in my opinion, like, you know, like, like you and I have spoken about before, there is no retirement for a guy like me, Dan. I'm going to be sitting here at this piano until I'm 105 going, you know, with no teeth. Okay. You sing here. <laughs> There's no, there's no pension for me. There's no pension package, but there is for university teachers. So they get the job. They want to hang on to the job. Doesn't matter what they do. They're still going to get paid. They're still going to retire, but they're not carrying on the tradition at all. In fact, they're destroying the tradition. They're destroying it because of their own lack of knowledge and their own laziness. And they transfer all this lack of knowledge. And by the way, laziness to the singer. I worked my ass off. Let me give you a couple of examples um, that would, are going to sound very ridiculous. But my next question is going to be, why don't they transfer into voice? OK, you say, for example, um, you know, you. Uh, you decide you want to be a Shaolin monk. OK, so, you know, you, you fly to wherever you have to fly to China, wherever. And, you know, you finally find the place, knock on the door. And you tell the you tell the the monk who answers the door, listen, I want to become a Shaolin priest. I really do, but I, I can only stay a week. After he's done laughing at you and throwing your ass off the mountain wherever you were, he's going to just slam the door and you know get on with his life. That's ridiculous. Same thing. You watch a Schwarzenegger movie. You said, okay, I want to look just like that. It's awesome. So you go to the gym. You tell him, hey, I want to look like our Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I can only I can only um, I can only uh, commit to a month of working out in the gym. Yeah. Again, they're going to thirty gonna, minutes. They're, yeah. they're going to yeah, for thirty <laughs> minutes at a time. They're going to laugh at you yeah, and they're yeah, going to yeah. throw you out of the street. But somehow, all these ridiculous stories 
never translate when it comes to singing. They just don't. I'll right. never understand why they don't, but they don't. I just watched a video the other day of Delmonico. He was at a, he was at a rehearsal. It wasn't even a show. He was on stage with the conductor, who was a woman, and he was singing uh, Adio Firito Azil from, from uh, the, the, the last act of uh, Madame Butterfly. Now, you know, for all those people out there who think, who bought the lie that you stand there and hold your hands and you smile and Puccini comes flying out. I watched Delmonico sing this aria, Alto Ascolo, Son Oh, and the next very next thing he did was he went oh <laughs> now he was one of the strongest singers we ever had on the planet and he's grabbing his stomach going oh man now you tell me is he working or not yeah. nobody wants to work anymore dan they don't want to do the work they just want the finished product but they don't want to do the work no, if no. tom Delmonico said to me when i met tom i said listen I do a lot of things, you know, fairly well, but not not one thing great. I want to do one thing great. I'm not leaving here until you make me an interna international opera singer. I'm not. So I'm a blank canvas. Do whatever you want. I don't care. But I need I need to have this happen. And if Tom had said to me, "Okay, that's fine, lad, but you better be prepared to hang on for about ten years in the studio," my answer would have been, "When can we start?" Right. OK, not a, not an argument about, well, listen, I don't have that much money. I don't have that much time. I, I can't I can't commit to all that work. It's way too much work. Blah, blah, blah. Yep. We've forgotten how much work it takes to do some of the things that are, you know, very, very successful today, or at least, you know, a lot of us have. And not only that, the work that you had to put in learning the language and you actually went to one of the best who's actually in that book that you pointed out, uh, Great Singers on Singing. Nico um, Castell. Yeah, I mean that's one of the, the the my my old coach as well, or my current coach still, Alex. He's he went to him as well. Like that, you want to go, you go to the best, right? Like that guy was known to be. How many languages does he speak? Oh my God, I, you know I don't even know, but but it, it's ridiculous, you know, right? Probably a dozen. I mean, yeah. all the romance. He knows all the romance languages. He knows that. I mean, yeah. I, I don't really know how many he knew, but he translated. Nico wrote books. His books are highly revered. I mean, he wrote literal word-for-word -word translations of all the Puccini arias, all the Verdi arias. You can buy these all in books. He translated them word-for-word, -word, but the real translation, not, you know, not, the, not the, the bogus translation that people see. Oh, well, here's the English underneath. I'm like, no, that's what somebody wrote in case you want to sing this in English, but it's not exactly what the aria means. Right. Nico translated them all, whole yeah. operas sometimes. Yeah. I mean, and anyway. There again, yeah. what, what did that take, two weeks? No, exactly. Yeah. You know, that guy, like, gee, come on, man. I mean, it's insane. Like, the, the, that's such hard work. Uh, that was one of the questions. Like, how long? Let me ask you. After you trained, and I'm gonna. I want to get back to technique on one thing about that. Like, how yeah, you, fine. I want to get back to about how you would teach a beginner. But besides that, I want to ask you. When you were getting your first, uh, your, what was your, where was your debut? My debut actually was at the Amato opera in new york in manhattan now a tiny tiny company uh -huh. okay but it was a new york debut neil shikoff also made his debut at the amato opera company when the amato opera had somebody who went on to have a major career they started putting you know pictures and bios up on the wall there mine's there so is neil's now i don't know if the company's still open anymore or not but that's how we all got our start in manhattan and by the way just because it was tiny didn't mean that the that the, the audience was not filled with yeah. agents, coaches, managers, all in Manhattan, all, all scoping out the newest talent because that's what Tony Amato did. He put all the young, new talent up on stage in a new, on, on a New York stage. Sure, it was tiny, but, you know, you learn stagecraft. I'll never forget the day that he screamed at me in front of everybody because I had no idea how to move on stage. I just came in with this big little Monaco voice and thought I was that I was it. That was all I had to do. And he dressed me down in front of everybody in that rehearsal because I was standing at the wrong angle. I didn't, I'd never been on stage before, Dan. I, I learned all this by the seat of my pants. Yeah. And he, Tony Amato, uh, he came up on stage and he started yelling at me. He said, no, no, what are you doing? He says, 
It's angles, angles. All the time it's angles. You're either this way or you're this way. You never show the audience face forward. Never show the audience your ass ever. Don't ever turn around on stage. He's screaming at me. I love it. And I was like, yeah. ooh, <laughs> I got a couple things to learn here. But you and learn you know, something I wrong. never hey Dan, I never forgot that though. I never and every and every show I did for the next 25 years, which is how long my career lasted in all these international stages. Yeah, what I, name yeah. name a few of those stages. Name a few of the stages. La Scala, uh Lincoln Center, uh Santa Fe, uh I, I need my bio. I need, I need my bio in front of me. Right. I don't know. I can't. I mean, every pretty much all no. the major. I mean, Seattle. Any any big opera houses you can think of. Yep. Pretty much. Amazing. Seattle. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, but the point is, I remembered that lesson, and I carried that with me on all in all the stage, stagecraft that I did from that point forward. And funny enough, the very first my Lincoln Center debut was a live telecast, not a broadcast, not an audio. It was video and audio, and it went out live as it was happening in everybody's living room, and that was Cavalleria. And I never forgot because, you know, I was always thinking about angles, you know, all the things that I was taught. My biggest fear actually was, was tripping and falling down because there were so many electrical cables taped down to the stage for all the cameras that were on there, which usually would never be there. I kept thinking, oh, my God, what if I fall, trip over something, and I'm on live TV? I don't know how you're going <laughs> to fix that. But I never worried about my voice. That's, and this is what I tell all my students. I was paralyzed by fear to step out on stage because I never knew what was going to happen. After La Monica, I couldn't wait to step out on stage. It worked every time. Always did. In fact, the best compliment I think I ever got from any opera companies uh, while they were writing the check was, you know, you have to be one of the most consistent singers we've ever had. Every night sounds exactly the same. That's I'm nice. like, yeah, thank Tom LaMonaco. And by the way, that's why I do not call this the Suriani singing method, because that is nothing but right. bitchy ego. Right. That's all that is. It's right. not my technique. I didn't have any technique. That's why I went to Tom. It was Tom's technique. That's why I call it the LaMonaco technique. I do the best I can to transfer what I remember and also, not for nothing, but I remember being in that studio for 13 years. Yeah. Now, there's other people that are claiming they were in for, you know, all these years or whatever. Uh, and most of them I don't remember or I've never seen them. So it's easy to say that after Tom's dead. OK, yeah. but my resume is online. It's there for everybody in the world to see. All you got to do is look it up. My website, CraigSuriani.com, is online. Just look it up. There's where my bio is. But these other guys. A lot of them, again, never stepped foot on stage, never had a career. And they're they're taking money to show people how to do something that they don't know how to do. Right. It's all barking. How does that happen? How does that happen? I, know, I don't you, get it. Would you go to a violin player that didn't play violin? Right. Yeah. Well, well see, that would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? But not, but right. when, when it comes to singing, though, we all seem to be able to get away with this. Oh, well, I read a few books. And I know a few scales. I know a few lip trills. Come on, I can show you how to sing. So really? Funny. Really? How about Nessun Dorma? You want to show me how to sing that? Right. It was, how it's, about, it's, now, how about if, 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 if a beginner comes to you, or not a beginner, just a, just a singer, and he goes, and he just, or I'm just asking you, if in, a, in, in the shortest way you could, how would you sum up the technique in general, like from the <laughs> bottom up? What would you that's say? Easy. That's easy. La Monaco, in my opinion, okay, let me, let me, let me always start with this. In my opinion, okay, so no, 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 so all the crazy people in YouTube don't come and burn my house down. In my opinion, take it or leave it. Tom was a genius because he took something, uh, vocal training, that up to that point was a very, um, it's a very it's a very nebulous kind of a thing. In other words, that's why a lot of teachers are always relying on, you know, imagery and, you know, weird things and thinking about weird things because they don't know what else to do. Tom understood the technique. He boiled it down to a series of physical gestures. If you make the technique physical, then you can make it. It becomes repeatable right. when it comes repeatable. It becomes dependable. 
to me that was genius yeah, that, but that. no one had ever done that before okay. every teacher before tom was always the same thing okay now think about the mask and try try to try to envision a rainbow shooting out of your forehead or out of your ass or wherever the hell it was shooting out of guess what the first time i stepped out in front of three thousand people i wasn't thinking about a rainbow right Dan. okay that doesn't work that's right. teaching by imagery i'm sorry it doesn't work it might work in a salon or if you're not under any pressure and there's only 10 people there. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine. There's a lot of people. Listen, you can make a great you can make a great living being a leader singer. You want to sing in salons, small private parties. That's fine. We're talking about opera. Opera is standing on a stage in front of all these people with 90 pieces of orchestra and no microphone, period. That's it. If you can't if you can't be heard then you're not an opera singer. Right. If you need a mic, you're not an opera singer. Right. So if you, if, 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 as far as I know it from talking with you about it many times, having the Stanley book and all that, you, I, I, the way I look at it is he breaks, he would break down the chest voice first, make sure that's clear, loud, and clear. And that's very important. If it's noisy, it's not right. And then he would go to the, like a pure head voice. Or we call it falsetto, you call it head voice, whatever you want to call it, but it was very pure like a sine wave. And we talked about that, so it doesn't have any chest color in it. It's, it's very pure sounding. And then to connect the two, those muscles that operate that system, then you would connect it to the chest by using a closed vowel like E or U or U uh or something like that, correct? Yeah, there, there are two pure vowels that we have. One is E and one is U. Those are the only two vowels that you can do falsetto on. The rest... Right would come out as mixed voice, not pure falsetto. You can right. only do pure falsetto on E or U. Right. And you would take that chest, the raw, kind of like a raw, clear chest up to around an E. And then from there up, you would change that vowel, like say an open vowel, like A or E. You would change the vowel to, o, to an U or E. And the head voice muscles will take over and help with that. Yeah, Tom and I would always work chest voice. <laughs> C, C sharp, D, E flat, E natural. Stop at E. Tom wanted every F covered. Now, I mean, in, in, initially, oh, when said he said the same yeah. thing. He covered yeah. that. Like, uh, he always talked about that. No, I mean, you can find examples when, when Luciano sure. decided to uncover an F. You can find examples when Caruso uncovered right. an F. Usually, they would do it to drop the weight before going to the high note. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, if you don't learn to cover the voice at F, if you're a tenor on the way up and from there on the way up, yep. then if you keep the voice open, obviously you're just going to be screaming by the time you get up to the top. So, you know, you can't be an opera singer unless you learn how to turn or cover the voice in, in Italian. Yeah. Yep. I was going to, I was going to say, cause yeah, a lot of people know it as cover. Some people know it as turn and some people know it as what you just said, say in Italian again. Girare. Right. Turn. Right. To turn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh and that's and so yeah, that's super I I, I love that because I I yeah. I mean for years I didn't understand the technique, like I said, all those years growing up. And then finally found people that did it for me and demonstrated. I was like, Oh, there it is. That's the thing I'm looking for right there. And then it made all the high notes easy. Everything became easy. I wasn't having to reach anymore. I didn't have to move my chin or my neck up i could just stay straight you could look at my face and it would be I, I, the work is being done through the support how do you look at support yeah we'll, we'll talk about like whenever you have like a new student and you know you get them all the way up to what C. well I, it, it, I, I never remember the freaking notes but well, it, it depends on you know, their mind. who it is but yeah the um uh, well look well yeah we'll get back to your question first uh the the support um you know, I tell my students, you know, about 90% of this game is breathing correctly. You can have all of the Lamana compositions you want to. You can have them all set up perfectly, which is no mean feat, trust me. You know, jaw, tongue, all this stuff. But without the right breathing, it doesn't make any difference. It won't, it won't matter. It's, it's, yeah, it's not the it's first person that, like, first good singer that has said that. Like the really good singers, they all say that. You can, you can have a, you know, you, you can have a 5.7 Hemi you know, engine in your car like I have, but if you got no gas, <laughs> doesn't mean a damn thing. Yeah. Nothing. So breathing is, you know, breathing is everything. Okay. And the idea is that, um, 
it's got to have the, you know, proper support. And, you know, you can talk, you know, every different vocal teacher will give you a kind of a different idea about what their version of support is. Again, I learned all this from Tom. Um, uh, but support, yeah, is, 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 is the most basic, one of the most basic things to learn. Without that, you don't have the strength to be able to maintain the kind of sound that he demanded that you maintain. That, that Delmonico maintained, that Corelli maintained. Corelli, I think, wrote somewhere that he, he felt like he lost five pounds at the, at the end of every opera. Oh, well, but you know, but the opera's not supposed to be any work. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so support being when, you know, you, breathe, you take your inhale and your ribs expand, right? And your, your diaphragm goes down, the ribs expand, your tummy goes out because the diaphragm goes down and pushes shit out of the way. And then you've got this, this body of, the, the you know the air is in the lungs yeah the, body, the body's expanded right so now what do you do what do you do with that do you tighten your belly do you tighten it like i'm gonna punch you in the in the abs you know you could look at it that way um i'm gonna i'm playing devil's advocate by the way so I'm just, no it's okay it's okay people think or, of support people think of support a couple of different ways and you know none of them are incorrect some people think of a of a lean outward like i do Okay. Some people think of a gentle lean downward. Some people think of both at the same time, right. but they both, they basically both achieve the same thing. The idea, Dan, is that we train to breathe into a, the bottom half of our lungs, not the top. If Tom saw me raising my chest, he'd come over and start slapping me. He goes, Hey, lower that mighty chest, lad. <laughs> he sometimes even encourage me to even, you know, sl slouch in a little bit to count to make my chest collapse so the air would go down I'll only have one choice go down you need to be you need to be full before you can lean on anything so if the first of all if the breath is not low and completely filled up you don't really have anything to lean against if you take a breath too high that doesn't do anything for your diaphragm the diaphragm is not a conscious muscle i can't tell you to let dan lower your diaphragm okay you, you can't do it but you can a lot of things that we learn in opera are, are secondary responses that I want, but I'll ask you to do one thing, but I'm looking for the secondary response. So in other words, if I want you to lower your diaphragm, I'll tell you then, you know, collapse your lungs, breathe down, down into, you know, the, your bottom half of your lungs. When they expand, the diaphragm gets pushed down flat. Once it gets pushed down flat, now you've got a base you can lean against. You've picked up something heavy before everyone else out there in the world has. The first thing you do is go, right. there's a little bit of a, right? There's, you're, you're, that's you leaning into your core without realizing it. No one ever told you that's, that's what you were doing. It's the same thing with singing. When I'm singing a high note and I lean down a little bit in it, in, inside my body, it feels like the, the, I'm singing a G, it feels like this. The whole time I'm going. I can imagine how loud it is in that room right now, so Dana. Look at your face. I look at her face. She's... I literally, I always like, I have to back up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, geez, you're fucking so loud. <laughs> love it. I love it. But you don't allow your body to collapse as you sing. That's very important, correct? You don't allow your ribs, just, like everything, just to collapse, right? Everybody's got a different kind of thought process about this. And, you know, I'm not, and again, um, what might work even better for you as a really accomplished rock singer might not be exactly the same right. uh, in opera because everything in opera seems, uh, it basically it seems they all, everything seems to be exaggerated. Okay. If you breathe low as a rock singer, you're going to breathe super low as an opera singer. If you want to open your jaw as a rock singer. Right. You might do that, but as an opera singer, right. <laughs> you're going to do that. Everything's a little bit more exaggerated um, because we're working. Well, what we're supposed to be doing is making the biggest acoustic sound on our own that we can make. Remember the analogy we talked about the other day? I said, you know, Dan, say you're going to the Chandler Pavilion. You want to go, you want to go see, uh, you want to go see the symphony orchestra. Okay. They're playing whatever, pick any, pick any piece they're playing. You're watching them and you're listening. It's all beautifully balanced. You can hear everybody. Then in intermission, go and grab a trumpet player from the from the orchestra and say, "Hey, come on back to the dressing room." 
can you play that same part for me? And the guy would be like, yeah, sure. You start playing, the first thing you would do is go, ah! Oh, yeah, rips your head off. What the hell are you doing? The guy would be like, I'm playing the trumpet. See, he doesn't have any concept of, oh, let me tone it down, you know, for the room or for this or for you or for the, you know, this. The one of the first things Tom taught me was, listen, and he called everybody the lad. He said, listen, lad, never, ever change your technique, okay? Not for the other singers that you're working with, okay? If they can't keep up, they can't keep up. Don't change your voice for the size of the opera house, okay? Yeah. Don't change your voice for the size of the orchestra. In other words, if there's a huge orchestra and they're playing loud, you can push all you want to. But if the conductor is not savvy enough to understand that the balance is off, you can push as hard as you want. You're not going to be able to compete with a 90-piece orchestra. So, um, but you asked before about boiling this down. Yeah. If I boil, and I tell my students this too. You know, I build loudspeakers for a lip, you know, for, not for a living. I build loudspeakers for a hobby. I always have, and I still do. I, we, I was working on some earlier, earlier on. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I just, I'm obsessed with, with this kind of idea. What Lamonaco taught was if you wanted to boil it down, I think of my tongue as nothing but a wave guide. Okay. Depending on where I put it, whether it's up for E or whether it's back for O. Right. Okay. It's a wave guide. This is always the same shape. E -A -O 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 -O. Right? I don't have, you don't change your jaw. The tongue right. changes vowels for you. So if I think about boiling the monaco down to the most basic concept, I breathe in until I, I'm, I, I take every breath literally down until it burns. I can't breathe in anymore. Once I'm completely full, you turn it right around again. You never want to stop the breath. You know, so that you don't, you know, invoke the Valsalva maneuver or, you know, glottal stop. Your chords go slamming together. I breathe in a gigantic amount. I set my jaw down the way Tom taught me. I set my tongue the way Tom taught me. This is all basically a wave guide. I start pumping vibrato over that position, and my throat basically feels like a piece of PVC pipe, if that makes any sense. In other words, I don't feel anything here. Right. And these guys that call me, and I've had three new guys this this just this week, okay, most of them from overseas. One guy, one guy um, told me that, you know, he was a young tenor and he won a competition. He won all this money. He hired a teacher in Canada somewhere. And, you know, within a couple of years, he couldn't sing past an F with this guy. F, F sharp. I can't remember what he said. I think he said F sharp. Right. And he's talking to me about all this. And, you know, I, I could see how much pain he was in. He was distraught. I mean, it hurt his throat. I said, all right, let's, let's work a little bit. It's always the same story. Within about 15 or 20 minutes, I get these guys opened up by showing them all the correct positioning. And before you know it, Dan, they're singing. They're singing B natural, C, okay? And, and I, don't, I'm not, I don't tell them where I am with the piano. I never did. Tom never wanted me to look at the piano. It freaks people. You're, the biggest thing you're dealing with, a lot of the times, the biggest thing you're dealing with is your brain. Right. You have to bypass the brain. If, the, if, if I say to you, okay, let's work on your high C, Dan, the first thing you're going to do is go, oh, shit, right? You're going to freak out. Your brain gets involved. Yep. Tom's exercises were all about bypassing the brain. Before the brain got involved with the voice and screwed everything up, they're, they're all exercises designed to go immediately to full voice, immediately to the vibrato right away before your brain has a chance to get involved. Right. But if, yeah, if I had to boil it down, you know, to, to a real basic level, yeah. that's what it feels like. I'm pumping really loud vibrato over a specific position with my tongue in a, a specific position. Yep. And guess what? The squealo is already there. It arrives. It just shows up. I don't think about squealo, okay? I don't try to make squealo right. but this is why all the teachers are all off track now today because that's all they hear when they play an album they hear that so they figure okay let's work on that you want to sound like delmonico i hear all kinds of squealo start squeezing and pinching your throat right. so these guys call me and the guy was like okay i can't sing past an f i spent 15 minutes with him dan i got him up to be natural right be natural without saying anything i said now how did that last note feel and he said 
I said, well, first of all, do you feel anything in your throat at all? And he said, for the first time in my life, I don't feel anything in my throat. I said, yeah, you're not supposed to feel anything in your throat. Number one. Number two, what note do you think that was? He said, I'm thinking that's, you know, like an F sharp or so. I was like, yeah, try B natural. Some guys, I get them up to C. Yeah. And the look on this guy's face it looked like he almost wanted to start crying. He's like, I have been studying. Some of these guys, it's very sad. I mean, some of these guys are like, I've been paying these people for, you know, 10 years, 15 years. And yeah. they come to me, and some of them come to me, their voices are completely broken. Some I've had to rebuild from the ground up, but I have. And these guys, I mean, they sound phenomenal. And they look at me like, like, like I'm, you know, like, like I'm working some kind of magic wizardry. And I'm like, no. So it's you're not saying it's not rocket science. No, it's not. <laughs> you know what it is, Dan? It's fucking hard work. Okay. A little bit of intelligence. Okay, you got to be a little smart about it. How many this. people you probably do probably scare people away when you do the exercise? They probably just go, oh, I don't want to do it like I can't do it like that. That's not what I what's not in their brain. They're, they're afraid to let go of the preconceived notion of nothing and everything's light and it just flows out like a like a stream in the sky. Yeah. And yet there's a reason that they call him. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm like, so why, so if you're happy with that, why are you calling me? Tell me. I know. No, I, I, I get, I, I can't tell you that, you know, I, uh, I love my students, but the, you know, a lot of times the first bunch of students I get, they'll be like, I got to sing that loud. And I'm like, we're not even loud. We're not even loud, but they're, but I'm like, you're not supporting at all when you're doing it the other way. You've got to, you've got to meet somewhere. You don't want to be an opera singer. Fine. We don't have to be an opera singer, but you got to, You've got to support your sound. And one, one, of the other, one of the other reasons I like to do these podcasts with you so much, with you specifically, is because, you know, you are one of the few guys that I know on the planet that we live on that has the, uh, the thirst for vocal knowledge that you are interested in all aspects of voice. Oh, yeah. You're, you're a fabulous rock singer and a fabulous rock singer teacher as well but that doesn't stop you from wanting to learn about lamonico wanting to learn about this wanting to learn about that i mean i've watched all your you know i've watched your videos i mean I, I, these I'm, rock guys call me again and they want to do anything the first thing i'm going to be doing is calling you for enough for a lesson saying dan help me out i haven't done this in a couple of years you know i i I, I was just speaking with uh, uh, Andrew Owens, who I did a podcast with earlier about opera and stuff. And it's like I'm really like it almost like I feel like uh, like frustrated in a way sometimes because I only got into opera in the last like ten years of my life. And it's like man, I love it so much. I wish I got into it in my twenties. You know, that's what you know. But when I was growing up, the whole thing was, oh, if you want to be a rock singer or a soul singer, you you don't learn opera technique. You don't do that, but that's I think that's baloney. I think the only thing that's helped solidify I'm I'm now getting older, 52, but my range is better. I'm more consistent than I ever was before when I tried contemporary vocal lessons. That's just all branding and bullshit, as far as I'm huh. concerned. If you look at the videos I have on YouTube, anybody who punches me up on YouTube, the first couple things you're gonna see is, you know, there's a video of, of me doing a cover of Iron Maiden, yep. Flight, of, Flight of Icarus. I mean, I love that concert where you're singing the opera, though, where you're doing you do a, a few songs. It's a it's a it's a concert. And I've watched a lot of those videos. That, that one, the big, long ponytail. Yeah. 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 Where was that? Where was that film? It was 1996. That was for that was a concert to raise money for the disabled persons organization. Um in my parents' hometown of uh, Watertown, New York. Oh, okay. Yeah, I love watching those. You, you did a lot of good, you know, some really cool tunes on there. So now, I cut those all up for YouTube, but actually that was one whole concert. And it started as 15 arias, wow. Neapolitan songs. Okay, it ended up being 18 because they called me out for three encores. That's great. 18 <laughs> pieces. Now you'll never sing harder than you will in a concert. If you, if you take a four hour opera like Carmen, and take all your parts and boil and put them all together. Yeah. Maybe you're singing for about an hour. Yeah. And that's what I do when I go to the co I go go coach with you know Josh Green or Kathy Olson in Manhattan. Um, and that's we would work for an hour, but you get through the whole opera. You just do all your own parts. Yep. But do a concert. There's no break. Yeah. It's just you, and it's nonstop all yep. the time. Yeah, that's great. 
That's great. Um, I'm gonna see. Do we have what else do we got? What else do we got? Got any notes there you want to check on? Uh, what else? Oh, so like uh, the state of opera now. COVID has even hit hit music in general, and um, which is horrible for everybody. In, you know, in, in that's a musician, and it's even getting worse. But the state of opera, obviously, the last bunch of years has gone down and down and down, and like trying to find performances. I mean. I was fortunate to go to Spain, so I got to see a couple performances. I got to see Domingo at, in Valencia, which was amazing as a bar- yeah. as a baritone, which was really really cool. Placido and- Domingo was was a key factor in 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 helping me propel my career forward. I, I owe him a huge amount of gratitude. Oh wow, yeah, and I always will because That's- he was one of the few guys. And well, I met him in L.A. at the Chandler Pavilion. They, they, they were looking for somebody to come in. So I got my start there as a cover. And I'd never covered any artist ever in my career. But the one artist that I agreed to cover was Domingo. Because wow. I was like, oh, hell yeah, I'll cover Domingo. And I showed up. And again, these guys that, you know, they're, they're, they're really, you know, they're, they're famous. They're singing well. These are guys who are like, you know, they're comfortable in their skin. I mean, they, Domingo couldn't have been. Wow. More friendly. Every night we we would we we'd be rehearsing, we're working, and then he'd be like, "Okay, that's enough. Craig, come on, we go to dinner. Let's go. Come on." Nice. He'd take me out with his whole family, and we all go out to dinner. Wow, that's the kind of guy he was. I mean, he was fabulous, and he did more to promote young artists than probably any other opera singer I I, I can think of out there today. And we need that now, right? Because I think that you know, just I mean, if you were to go to a high school and talk to any kids about opera. I don't think you get a, a hit kid raising his hand. Like I don't. Like, what? What's yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, what's that? You know what I mean? So I, what, 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 what do you think can be done? Like, like we talked a little bit about that the other day. Like uh, I don't know, master classes. I don't know. What do you think can be done? Like that could help get the word out a little bit. Well, listen, I, I don't, I don't lament the fact that I went to the university and got a degree in music because that's where I learned conducting, composition, music theory, music history. Those are all completely invaluable. And I would never, you know, I would never trash that idea at all for anybody. However, you know, again, most of the young singers that are going in, they they get, they get all this, but the the assumption is they're also going to get trained so that they might be able to become world-class singers. And it hardly ever happens. Um, I think I think master classes is you know obviously one way to go. And as soon as international travel opens, you can bet that the twenty guys I got waiting for me to show up in you in the UK to give a master class as for, as soon as the flights open, we're on our way. Yeah, we were talking about it right before COVID. Oh, hit. that's great. Yeah, yeah. And then that's good. COVID happened. We're like, okay, let well, me know. I'll go with you. I'll carry your bags. <laughs> yeah right i'll be bag boy i'll come just to come hey, <laughs> no you won't you'll, you'll be my example of what a great great rock singer sounds like <laughs> i'll be, be bad boy. <laughs> um what else uh how long would it take you to prepare I, I asked andrew this when you when you were gonna do a new role that you hadn't studied and say oh you know you signed the contract for let's say it's you know labo i don't know something something how long does it take you uh, and how much practicing do you do from the time you get that role till the time you hit the stage? How much? How, t- how much time? Because you got a, the language, the songs, the art, the acting, everything. How long would you say it, it would take you from beginning to end? That's that's not an easy question to answer. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples though. Uh, when you first started working with Tom, the Doctor Lamonico, okay, he forbade any practice at home anything oh. i'm like tom are you kidding me come on we, we you know we, we all want to we all want to you know get out there all want to practice and no you don't practice this technique because it's a big technique and if you're doing it wrong then you're paying me to do it here and then you're going home and unwinding it all the rumor, don't do that the rumors pola did that to Pavarotti too when he first started studying they, that was the thing you could you study with me every i think it was every day for 45 minutes or 90 minutes whatever it was, but you do not go home and sing without me. You know, you come yeah. back tomorrow. You I ready? took three lessons a week with Tom, three lessons a week. And I didn't, I didn't practice at home. So to compensate for my frustration, what I would do is I went out and bought every score that I thought that someday 
I would sing. And my you way to handle that frustration right. was I learned all the roles while I was studying with Tom. So when I got hired for one, I usually already knew it. Now, there were occasions on the road where I would be singing one opera, but I got hired for another one that I didn't know. Like, for example, I can remember um, sitting outside by a pool in a hotel, singing one opera, but studying Norma at the same time because I didn't know Norma. And I was about to you know, make my debut at Seattle uh, singing Norma. Jane Eaglin, by the way, made her debut, with, her American debut with me wow. in that production of Norma. Um, that can get a little dicey because you're on the road doing one thing and then in all your spare time, I mean, you never stop working. I'm sitting by the pool, but I got a score in my hand. I got headphones on. I got all these recordings sitting next to me. I'm studying the Italian. Uh, the short answer to your question is if it's an opera that I've never saw before, I don't think I would ever go near the stage before six months or a year while I was working on that role. Andrew said about the same. And, and, but that changes as you get better, as you get older, as you get more familiar with the, the, the technique, the Italian, you could hand me a role yep. and it, you know, it might take less time. There were some roles that I refused to learn because they were, I don't know, in my head, uh, they just, they didn't make any sense. I sang, I sang, I was, I was fortunate enough to be able to sing mostly Puccini. You know, some Verdi had to be handpicked because a lot of it was too heavy. A lot of it was too light or too high. So, I mean, you have to, again, you, that's part of the, that's part of the uh, formula too, Dan, is knowing Where what you your strengths that. are, because that's what you want to, that's how you put your, your best foot forward. Um, what we've got going on today is exactly what Tom coined uh, way back in, in 1989. He said, when I asked him the same question, I'm like, Tom, why are there these guys out there singing this stuff that shouldn't be singing it? And he simply said, lad, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Now, today, I mean, it was bad then, yeah. but today... We've only got one or two tenors doing everything because they can, because there isn't anybody else. Yep. And you know what? I mean, I'm not trashing these guys. They're offering them a lot of money. You know, you don't turn down the money, but is there are, there were a couple of roles that I sang throughout my career that maybe were, you know, maybe one size or so too big, but I did it. I did it under the radar. I didn't do it at La Scala. I mean, I did it under the radar and, you know, I took the money, but within reason, okay? If anybody ever offered me Wagner, I would have laughed at them. If they offered, hey, Craig, come and sing Forza. Come and sing Otello. Come on, you got a big, dark, round voice. Sing Otello. I'd be like, fuck no. I'm not going anywhere near that. Right. You need to understand, you know, you, get, you got to know how to stay in your lane, okay? And these guys today don't have to anymore because they have no competition. Yep. One guy who's got a, real, a fairly full lyric voice can artificially darken it, go in the recording studio. He can record in Lohengrin if he wants to. Who the hell is going to question it? They're going to buy it. Okay, that's what's going on now. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, we went about an hour, hour and 12. Already? And yeah. It goes Damn. Fast. What else? But anyway, is there anything else anyway the, whole, the whole point of the whole rant, then, is that it's not getting better. It's getting worse. And the point, and the reason I called you is because I'm getting scared to the point where I'm really worried about watching what is one of the world's greatest art forms completely go away, completely go down the toilet. I mean, Dalen was not uh, necessarily brought up in an operatic household, not at all. but she's been with me long enough to know what the sound sounds like. So the other day, yep. She comes into the studio and I'm playing some tenors and I'm watching some videos and I call her in and, and I'm, you know, I'm playing one of my favorite songs, you know, Tu Canum Pianye, right? A Neapolitan song. And I got one of these, one of these tenors from the Metropolitan Opera, very famous guy right. and singing it. And, you know, I'm like, let me play this for you. It wasn't horrible, but I, it certainly wasn't that exciting either. I mean, it was very polite, you know, it was uh, pretty Oh, be bella montagna stanotte, right? And she listened to it. She's like, yeah, that's pretty. Then I punched up Corelli live on the Ed Sullivan show. 
Now, Corelli did not over darken his voice. He just sang with the instrument he had based on how he was taught. Right. And he walks out and goes, Come bello montagna stanotte. And her jaw went. Right. Damn. Then I played, <laughs> then I played Delmonico. Yeah. And it went, and her jaw went down even lower. Then I played Giacomini. And after all that was done, I turned to her and said, listen, now do you understand why opera is going down the toilet? Yep. That's all I had to do, <laughs> play a couple of guys. Now yeah. we have this all in history, Dan. It's all there. All anybody's got to do is go back and look. So you don't think, you don't think, because uh, someone, so some, I know that, you know, playing devil's advocate, you know, you're going to, comments are going to come up on YouTube or whatever. They're going to go, that was Corelli's voice. That was Delmonico's voice. There's only one Corelli. There's only one Delmonico. Yeah, but they worked years and years and years to develop that Corelli or that Delmonico voice that they had. Right. Yeah. People today don't want to do any work, Dan. Right. I'm sorry, not everybody. Right. Most. I sh I'm sorry, I should, I should modify what I'm saying. Yeah. Most people don't want to work that hard anymore. Right. Like this, this, this university professor. We don't have to work that hard anymore. It's a new day. It's a new age. It's, those guys sang too dark. They sang too heavy. They sang too loud. We we can we can lighten it up a little bit now, really? Okay. Well, I mean, yeah. I guess if uh, well, I mean, I won't go there. It's a podcast. I don't want to say anything embarrassing. But there's there's a lot of analogies I make to my students while they're singing. Okay. Sometimes most of the time I make analogies to working out in the gym. Okay. I'm like that's why that's why Tom's uh, warm up routine did not change for 13 years while I was in the studio and not once it didn't change because they were all designed just like the exercise in the gym. I mean, you go and walk into a gym 200 years in the past. What are you going to see? The same exercises, right? Girls, bench press, yeah. shoulder press. Yeah. Okay. The machines get fancier, but the exercises are the same. Why? Because yeah. they're proven to, to, they're proven to grow, yeah. to, 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 to develop strength and growth. Yep. That's why Tom didn't change the warm up. Yeah, there's a guy I follow. I can't think of his name. I'm so dumb. He uh, he's he's a YouTube. He's a uh, old school like power lifter, and he's hilarious. This guy's hilarious, and people call. He he does a thing where he has a couple drinks and lets people ask questions. And he's like, what you know. One of them was, and I like kettlebells, but he he just goes like this. He's all about you know deadlifts, squats, overhead presses snatch you know that's it that's all you need you want strength that's what you need then go do your sport and you'll get you'll be strong for your sport exactly he, you know he's like he rages on people that use like the bosu ball and they balance with one dumbbell over their head and they sit on the ball and they're you have to balance it because you gotta he's like that's not gonna make you stronger and then he, the one that someone asked about oh what do you think of kettlebells he goes let me show you what i think of kettlebells he gets up he has the camera following picks up a kettlebell walks over puts it up a doorstop <laughs> they're great door stops like i got nothing oh. against these kettlebells but he's you know i really like that as i get older and you know you still try and i still try and work out and, and do things like that it's like i don't mess around with like any of the vanity lifts or anything like that i just do some squats i do some deadlifts i do chin-ups i do hanging leg raises that's there's my workout that's all you need there's no reason to invent reinvent the wheel there really isn't yeah i try to the only reason i can think of today again is that most people, not all, but most people, the concept of working that hard, that long, they just can't commit to anymore because we live in a day and age of instant gratification. I mean, you know that. You yeah. know that. We do. I know. We do. You, you tell somebody you got, you want to work La Monica, you better be prepared to do it for a couple of years. Yeah. They'll go running with their with their hair on fire. Yep. Nobody wants to do that kind of work. Yep. And can you hear what's the bird? That? Can you hear the bird? Is that a bird? Oh, bird. <laughs> going crazy. I know. She's learning the technique. Right, Tortuga? <laughs> tell, the, tell the bird to lower the jaw a little bit more. She'll get going. She's going. <laughs> oh. you, know, you know, and again, um, and I think I said this to you last time we spoke to Dan. What really breaks my heart is that, is that now that things have kind of gone so far south, that there's so many armchair experts out there who've never sung one note in their life, who've never stepped on, stepped one foot on stage in their entire life, are going on YouTube 
with their list of all these tenors and what they're all doing wrong or what, and why isn't anybody ever saying to them, okay, great. Can you please put, can you please put on YouTube your version of you singing this the correct way so that I understand what you're talking about? Yeah. Why does anybody call them out? I can't stand it. Reaction videos, it drives me nuts. That's I understand cool. you want to get hits, you want to become a YouTube star, it's going to make you money. That's awesome. Yeah. If that's, yeah. if that's your role, but don't, don't put it in like, you know what they're doing unless you know what they're doing uh, my favorite are the vocal co vocal coaches who look like they're 14 years old vocal coach reacts to rob halford singing whatever okay rob halford was singing before this person was even an idea yeah. and that person's parents yeah. mind okay right. health you know these guys have been singing forever that's why they're so good and the the audacity to be yeah. able to go on you it's like you said but you said it before it's about getting hits that's it yeah it, and i get that and i'm like i'm for it too like this that's great if that's what you want to do that's great it's not what i want to do i wanted to be a singer that's what i wanted to do i wanted to sing and i wanted to get better and i don't want to be inconsistent and these are the things that were important to me obviously they were important to you and you made a career out of it you listen, know I mean? i'm listen i i'm here to tell everybody look this can still be done. It's still attainable, okay? Yes, we have way, 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 way fewer people now that are that are qualified to be able to do this. But for God's sakes, if you're going to lay your money down to anybody, make sure you find somebody who's already done yeah. what you are wa wanting to do or what you're training to do. Ask them for the damn resume. Ask them where they've sung. Ask when these universities sing, oh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to ask my teacher. I'm afraid. They're, they're so afraid of confrontation. Right. Really? These guys haven't sung anywhere. They haven't done anything. So again, if it's all, that's what I'm saying. There's still a handful of people out there that know what they're doing and they know how to teach. Okay. Right. Find one of them, make sure they really have a real background before you pay any of them. Okay. Just make sure of that. I'm not, I'm not saying this about me study with whoever you want to. But just well, make sure that they really are a real opera singer and that they understand the old school technique. Otherwise, you're going to get tied up in knots, yep. your throat's going to hurt, and you won't have a career. Well, there's your segue. Where can people find you? What is your website? The website is simply craigsuriani.com. I own the domain. Apparently, there's only one other Craig Suriani in the whole world or in the whole United States, and he lives in California, Dan. So you can go find him. He's somewhere <laughs> out there, but... Okay. He had the domain for a while, then I bought it. I own it now. Um, it's just simply my name. It's one R, two N's, CraigSuriani.com. I've got, uh, there's a Facebook page. It's called Craig Suriani Vocal Instructor. Okay. I put the Lamonaco videos on there. I put them all on YouTube. Um, there's yeah, wait, videos wait, 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 on YouTube, just Craig Suriani. I, I forget. I just, I don't have it in front of me. Is it yeah. Just, what's your name? Yeah. Just, okay. just, put, just put my name on YouTube. There, you'll, you'll see all the concert videos. You'll see all the, you know, unveiling the secrets of Lamonico technique videos. Um, right. You'll see all this stuff on there. Uh, and, you know, the videos are still coming. You know, I put them out as I think of them, as I think of things that I haven't covered. And no, again, you can't sing by watching a video one time. I mean, I get people calling me all the time. Hey, I just want to take one lesson. I want you to show me how Lamonico works. I'm like, you know what? Save your money. Go buy a nice bottle of scotch or whatever. Because yeah. you can't, that's yeah. like asking Arthur Schwarzenegger to show you, you know, I want to look just like you, but I've only got an hour. Hurry up. Yeah. Hurry up. Yeah. Really? That's what I'm up against today. But my students, they're all doing a fabulous job. They understand the technique. You know, they're in for, you know, the, the longer haul. I mean, you know, they're, they're sticking around and they're doing, they're all doing fabulous work and, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for all of them. I really am. It's it, to me, I, I, I should be doing a happy dance all day long awesome. that I'm booked, that I'm booked as much as I am. And I'm booked all day, every day. It's a full-time job. And it's amazing to hear like the transformations. Cause I hear it. I hear everything, you know, cause we're right in this room. I'm right out there. I hear all of it. And it's so amazing. Like he'll come out and like, damn, he sounded good today. Like, yeah. you know, it's, it's awesome to hear the, the differences. Yeah, that's as it progress. Well, I appreciate you, man, and um, and uh, thanks for doing this again. You know what I mean? This is this Listen. is great, and 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 I think people, I think it's people are gonna get this, see more of you now uh, again, and 
Um, I'm always looking for your videos, and I'm going to keep in contact with you. So thanks again. For I, listen, absolutely. It's all I'm I'm on I'm on 24 hour call for you. Trust me. Uh, listen, it, it, it's never it's never an issue, and this is always a pleasure to talk to somebody who not only understands one technique but several vast techniques. That's that's very unique. Uh, we don't really have very many people like that around anymore. And you understand a lot of different techniques, probably more than I do. Well, you let me know if you're going to do the thing in the UK. I'm going. You got to tell me. I'll go. I'd go. Ah, we'll, That'd be we'll, fun. We'll, we'll book a ticket. We'll all go. It'd be great. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody. This was Real Singers on Singing, the opera. And, and I'm calling this the series Opera Singers Do It Better. And uh, thanks for Craig and his wife for being here. And I'm Danny Formica. And we'll talk to you guys soon. All right. Take care. My pleasure, Dan. Take care, Dan. Thank you.